Welcome to Britflix. Thank you, Stuart. Going back to that time in your in your kind of youth growing up, what, who or what was the moment where when the light went on when I want to be an actor? Um, I used to talk about being an actor a lot when I was very young, mm. when I saw certain. Um, my dad was a great film buff, and okay. he I've got a, I credit him a lot for giving me a great love of that love okay. of especially old films and all the old black and whites and the American film noirs and okay. you know the you know the Jimmy Cagney's and the, you know and the Spencer Tracy movies and um, uh, what's his name um, Humphrey Bogart all that Maltese Falcon all these sort of movies but he all, I saw a lot of other movies through him as well. Um, I saw the thing, you know, I, I remember the first time I saw a Buster Keaton film and someone went off a cliff on a motorbike and I actually thought, oh, I want to be a stuntman, I want to do that. <laughs> I want to be a guy who rides off a cliff on a motorbike. So when you're young and you get, you're, I'm very, you're very excitable, I talked mm. about that a lot. Oh, I want to be a film, I'd love to be a film director, Dad. Oh, I'd like to be a film actor. And it never really sort of, it was there, but I didn't really go mm. on about it. There were a lot of other things I was very good at as well, particularly sports and things like that. But... I was nine years old, and my dad got me out of school mm. uh, under the under the, under the pretense and the guise that I was going off for a dental appointment, which was just an absolute load of rubbish. And I only found that out when we got to the end of the street corner after he'd picked me up at the school gates, with me thinking, "Oh my God, I'm going to the dentist." And then he knelt down and he said, "Look, don't worry, we're not going to the dentist. I'm going to take you to the pictures." And he took me, and he got my brother out of school, yeah. and we went to see Waterloo with Christopher Plummer and Rod Steiger. I mean, this huge war epic. Yeah, yeah. And my dad took us up in the sort of gods and we watched this movie and that was really, wow. Yeah. And that stuck with me. That memory really stuck yeah, with yeah. me. But I didn't really get to... It was a long route before I actually yeah, yeah, started, yeah. to be so honest was, with you. So was there any formal action education that you received in, in becoming an actor? Or? Um, well, I went to... When I, I, when I first decided, OK, that's it, that's what I want to do, yeah, yeah. I auditioned for drama colleges and I went to the Webber Douglas Academy, okay. uh, which unfortunately is no longer there. It joined, it, it got sold off as a private entity and it joined, all the students had to join up with Central School of Speech and Drama. So unfortunately the Webber Douglas Academy is no longer around, it's no longer with us. What do you, yet, think, what do you think that kind of education gave, prepared you for in terms of being an actor? Um, well, I've got to be honest, it was very old school in the sense that it was very classical Mm. drama education, you know, yeah. we did a lot of the classics, you know, so it was all Shakespeare and Shaw and Coward and and the, the Russians, the Chekhovs and this sort of thing. Right. So so we there was a lot of stage work um, and, and, and very little sort of camera and TV work. We did do camera and TV weekends and bits and bobs like that, you know. Mm. So really when it came to working on camera and working with film, yeah. that when it came to doing that, that was really me more going back in my memory and remembering those moments when I was a kid and watching those movies with my dad. Okay. And then learning, you just learn on the job. But everybody learns on the job doing yeah. that anyway. You don't so it's a foundation for the end to learn. Yeah, I don't think there's an, an actor in the world that would say, yeah, I knew exactly what I was doing straight away. I mean, you just, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. learn on the job, you know. It's like, it's, it's like if, a, if, you know, if you were a, a, a mechanic, the first car you work on is obviously going to be a bit sort of nervous and you think, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? I mean, but, you know, if, 20 years from there, you're, you're, you're fixing a Ferrari. So yeah, it's that kind of thing. What was your first paid acting role? First paid acting role was, uh, oh, gee whiz, I think I did a, a, a play at the Gate Theatre when Stephen Doldry was there. Okay. And um, it was another director though, a guy called Peter Benedict. And we were on a sort of profit share thing. Mm. We didn't get a lot, <laughs> but I think, I think, if I remember rightly, I think we got a little bit, <laughs> but it wasn't much. But if it was like pay paid, yeah, that was, that was the first sort of paid, but it was next to nothing. But even so, you know, that's you go so home and you, something, yeah, right. something in your hand and you go, my God, someone's just paid me to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, the, yeah, it got better as it went along. I'm trying to remember the first like proper, proper paid job, like real paid. And that was probably the tours, you know, when I went on tours, yeah, yeah. theatres and abroad and in, in the UK as well, that was paid. It wasn't huge money, but it was, you know, you got paid, yeah. So that was the first paid ones. Right. As I was saying earlier, I've just come back from Cannes, so I, uh, right. met, I met a few people that, that know you, so I... Oh, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> What does she look like? <laughs> <laughs> well, both fellas. <laughs> uh, She's not still looking for alimony, is she? <laughs> 
So, so uh, the first one I spoke to was Ian Ratray of... Uh, oh, yeah, Ian, yeah, yeah. And he asked me to ask you to recount the story of where you were asked to come on stage after the last horror movie and the... Oh, I my God, we you, were just talking about that. I think that. you frightened somebody, didn't you, is there? Well, yeah, I was... We, the screening of the last horror movie, when it was part of that particular Fright Fest mm. year... Yeah. Uh, it was on a Sunday, it was a Sunday afternoon at the Prince Charles Theatre, just off the back of Leicester Square there. And, I mean, I was really sorry, it was just packed to the rafters, I mean, it was full, mm. totally, there wasn't a seat left. And Julian said, look, you, we need you to come in, you don't have to sit and watch the film, but come in, sit there. So I thought, well, I will go in and watch the film, and I sat there. And the idea was that there was somebody else who was in the audience that was asked beforehand to ask Julian when he went on stage to do a bit of a Q&A, this particular question, and the question was, oh, what's happened to Max now? If I don't know if anyone knows the movie, Ma yeah, the last one, right? Uh, what's happened to Max now? Is Max uh, is, is has he been arrested? Is he still on the loose? And it was like a sort of joke question yeah. in a way. And then Julian just put his hand up like that to the lights, and he was on the stage. And he said, "Well, actually, I I did see him in the foyer, and if I'm not mistaken, I <laughs> think he's in the audience." I stood up. This girl next to me screamed, and like, and it just went ballistic, and. Uh, I think someone mentioned a particular filmmaker, somebody, Castle, uh, I, uh, somebody who's a fam famous horror hmm. guy, and he said it was a typical moment like that. So it was, a, it was extraordinary. It was like, <laughs> when this girl literally jumped out of her skin because she suddenly realised who she'd been sitting next to. Not me, she was, it was about Max on the film, and she just absolutely freaked out. So there, it was a really... A, a, similar, a similar thing, a couple of years before at Fright Fest where they showed Ed Gein, not, oh, right. not even at the Q&A bit. The yeah. guy playing Ed Gein was sat behind us, oh, God, me and my yeah. wife. Yeah. And you know the Prince Charles seats with that kind of yeah, rock? Yeah. He got up to get up, pulled her chair. <laughs> she looked up and it's Ed Gein. Ed Gein is just looking at her in the face. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's great stuff. There's great, great stories stuff. like that. I heard, the, I heard the great story about when after si the success of Silence of the Lambs, Hopkins would now and again, he would pop in with a baseball cap on and all the rest yeah, of it, you know, yeah. and just sit at the back and watch people's reaction to this film, you know. And apparently one cinema he went in, right at the end when it finished, he leant forward to this woman and he went... Tch, 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 like that. <laughs> That's genius, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's just crazy. You can do mad things like so, that. So, Julian, who, who, who made, Julian went yeah. to made last horror movie, also you worked with him on Summer Scars. I did indeed, yeah. And uh, he was telling me that originally he went for the, for the part you were playing, he, you, were trying, you were trying to do a West Country accent, I think you said. Yeah. And then you went away and... He changed it, yeah. What to a Lancashire accent is that? You're, yeah, you're northern. Coventry, you're from Coventry. Yeah, I'm, I was born in Coventry, and so, um, my 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 mum died when I was a baby, but I was brought up by my gran, and she was from Hull, so okay. she was a Lincolnshire, Humberside woman, yeah, yeah. and my dad was from that part of the world, so all those kind of northern sort of vowel sounds were there. But I've done a lot of northern accents before, so yeah. I did this guy. I mean, I suppose if you listen to it, it's sort of like Sheffieldy sort of way, yeah. you know, because I know some guys from Sheffield, and I was. A bit well, of do, that. You, do, you, do you have to, because he said, I think he said you, you went away for a few days, they come back and it was like, right, you're ready with the accent. Yeah. Was like, so what process did you go through there? Is it just... Well, I'll tell you the story about why we didn't go with the West Country accent to start with, because I really wanted to do that accent simply because uh, it was, the film was being shot in Wales, right. it was set in Wales, mm. the kids were all Welsh and they were all like Cardiff and Swansea and countryside Welsh kids, and you could tell from their accents they were Welsh kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We wanted this character to be an outsider, but I thought, well, what's the next county along? Gloucester. Mm. So I thought, well, why don't I do this kind of Gloucester sort of accent, you know, a little bit sort of Fred Westy, I suppose. Yeah, 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 sure. But the problem with a Gloucester accent, it doesn't matter what you do, which way you swing it, if you're playing an itinerant character, which is what Peter was in Summer School, yeah. it sounds just a bit too farmery. You sound like a farmer, you know. Well, so... A brand new combat Yeah, oh, okay, so... Okay, I see you now. So it... And that was the worry that, oh, does he sound a bit like a farmer, though? And it might be because of that. Are we going to get connotations where it could be a bit comic because of yeah, that? You'd, you'd, yeah, you would have you you, took me out of the film. If it, exactly. Yeah. You lose a bit of the sense of like, you know, so I thought, well, let's just make him a real drifter that he's from. He could be from anywhere then. Mm. So I just thought, well, OK, the easiest one to plonk, on, plonk into in the short space of time was a northern accent. So I just mm. went with that. Literally, in the space of three, I just thought, I'll just go with that then. Brilliant. With with the main mannerisms of Victor, for me, watch watching you play him, it was yeah. it was like it was sort of 
as much about what you weren't doing as much as what, as yeah. what you were sort of actually yeah, demonstrating being evil. And how 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 was that sort of how was that kind of Mazen worked out in terms of was it on the page? Was it something you took? No, or yes. did you and Paul discuss it? How was that kind of? Yeah, I've met, I mean, I, I'm probably sounding like a broken record. I keep using the word homework, homework, but that's what you do as an actor. You go and you do. And no, it's, it's good to uh, know. Yeah, you've got to do you you do your homework. I. The one thing I noticed from watching a lot of these uh, Balkan men, mm. you know, Serbians, Croatians, Bosnians, is that they are very, very still. They have a stillness about them that's mm. very solid. They always look very planted in their centre where they are. Yeah. And, and from that as well comes a certain tone that they have in their vocal tone right. that's very sort of dark. It's like almost they mirror almost, you know, elements of what they're about they're about. Yeah. I mean, all those paramilitary guys that we were playing in that film, like Sean and myself and, and some of those soldiers in, and the guys who played the soldiers in the film, you know, Ryan and the others, you know, there is a sense of like that, boom, they are just planted, these guys. And mm. the more you watch them and the more newsreels I looked at and the documentaries I watched and the footage and looking in books and watching pictures, I mean, you could just see they were these men. They are real kind of men that just yeah. go, boom. You know, There's and no, he, going on, no, absolutely not. And even you know, even if you look at someone like I don't know, you look at someone like uh, Novak Djokovic as a tennis player. You mm. know, you just know this is a guy. You know, playing tennis, he's so fit, he's so together, mm. and there's something very focused and boom about him. You know, he's just there. Well, I know he's Russian, but look at the way Putin carries himself off the yeah. press. It's all about him. all of those guys from that part of the world. But when they when they go for it, when they get emotional, mm. that's the lovely contrast you get. You know, Russians are like, the Russians can be very still, sip a bit of vodka name, but when they go and they get poetic and they start singing, it's like mm. huge, mm. like their country. It's massive because yeah, of where yeah. they come from. Serbia, I think those Balkan guys are like that. I'm sure mm. when they get a few down them, it's, it's also like, it's that idea, you know, the men kiss each other as greetings, things yeah, like that, which, yeah. in Britain, which, is, which, we don't do, do we? No, exactly, and of course that lovely moment when Sean's brother dies, you know, mm. and, and, and who played beautifully by Alec, and... That lovely, that's a lovely, great moment. Because mm. you're just not... I, think the audi I don't think the audience is expecting that moment either. There's a, there's a lot of those moments in the seasoning house that you're not expecting. You know. um, monsters. Monsters. It's, it's, not a it's, it's not traditionally in a kind of horror. Yeah. There's, there's a monster. It's about the evil that men do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no one running... It's a fantasy element. Yeah. I mean, there's no one running around in a mask or some sort of special makeup or it's not an alien thing. This is the brutality of human also, beings, what they I, do. I never realised, obviously, I mean, it makes sense, but it's like the, the old, what, what we know as the Joy Division under the Nazi stuff, this season yeah. house yeah. is, represents that. That, that bru yeah, well, that brutality, that coldness is, is that, it's that similar thing, that mm. SS, Nazi, dark, very business-like, mm. you know, sort of edge to the, hor mm. to the horrible things that they do. There's no debate about it, they just do it. And, and it's it's really yeah it's really cold and that makes it even harder I think for people to sort of try and put their brain in gear with mm. that to think God how can someone do that what, what is somebody well, getting out of that I'm that thinking, they do that I think when we first meet you and we get the girls in the line and then yeah. one's brought out for an example as it were yeah 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 it's really even that shocked me when I saw it to be honest with you I was, well, so, so, so so seeing it and playing it you you still get yeah yeah but well when when you're filming something like that it's a very Technical day. That it was, was a very a well. It's a very <laughs> well. It's a very long day. It's a very long day that that was, and mm. because there was a lot of technical things to get right, and you just have to be aware of that. And it's just about again the home. You stay in the zone. You stay very focused and mm. just go for it. But obviously, when a film is edited and crafted and put together, you know, you don't see that side of it until mm. you actually see it. And you're always surprised as an actor. You see things that get cut out that you thought mm. were going to be in. You get things that are in that you thought were going to get cut out, you know, whatever, it goes both ways. But a scene like that, you know, and the way it's done, it's like, oof. I mean, from a writing point of view, it was a really nice, not nice, nice is the wrong word, a really clever reversal of expectations. We think we're meeting you, and, and we think you're trying to soft soap them yeah. to say, look, you're going to work for me, you'll be fine. Yeah. And then it's like, and this is what happens if you don't, you don't say it. I know, you cut. it's really, really great. It is an amazing way yeah. of sort of, okay, he's a... And also, I think what's shocking about it is how early on in the film no, it comes. Yeah, it's like, oh my God, we okay, kick off. It's but what's, really... what's interesting then is the the kind of there's like a relegation mm. that happens when Sean P Pertwee's character arrives. Like you're exactly. you're the boss for, 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 the, for the majority of the mm. time, and then suddenly there is like yeah the, the alpha, the, yeah, the the alpha, alpha male. male thing gets yeah, tipped yeah. a bit. The scales yeah. get tipped. 
Which is what I mean, because that's that's the kind of that's the thing I find interesting about your character is that you are clearly through through what we see in the opening scene that alpha male. But actually, I think there seems to be something that's sort of I want to get out of this. There, there must be a, an, you don't know what the exit is. You keep the kind of status quo going, as it were. Well, that's interesting you say that, Stuart, because you're the first person who said that word. I want to get out of this because my super objective for my character throughout the entire film was always as the character. This is a guy who who wants to get out of here. He wants to make as much money as possible. Mm. He would be the kind of guy that, you know, you read about in the papers ten years later, oh, found in the south of France, you know, arrested, la 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 la, and dragged yeah. off. He doesn't want to be there, he doesn't want to stay there. And everything he's doing is all about you? business and he's the wheeler dealer mm. guy. Mm. And the history that Sean and I put into our characters when we were playing them as Goran and Victor was that they knew each other when they were young lads, in the, growing up in the same town, mm. growing up in the same area, knowing the same people. And, and Sean even said something really interesting. He, goes, I th he said one day, he said, you know what, Kevin, I reckon when I was younger as Goran, you're the kind of guy that he would have been jealous of. He would have liked to have been like you, but he wasn't. Totally right. And then, of course, when the scales tip and Goran is this, the real local, the countrywide, you know, well-known kind of paramilitary, it's the scales have tipped on the other face, well, on the Goran's other foot. Goran's baser, isn't he? It's like Victor's clever and can work out the pros and cons. Goran is just about a terrified... Right like, wing, yeah. cleanse the nation, yeah, yeah. get it over with. Yeah. And I think you see the joy in Sean's face as Goran's character in that... Mm. Scene with the cognac in the room, that is, you can see he's loving every minute yeah. of getting one over on me. That I've he knows it. something that I, yeah, yeah, he yeah. didn't, that I didn't think he knew. No. Oh, yeah. that's good. I, no, that was, that was a really, I thought it was a really neat part of the. Yeah. Especially given we think you're the one that's yeah. in charge, as it were, but actually. Yeah, so there's, really, somebody we enjoyed, more, yeah. there's somebody more evil to There's me, something yeah. going on. Well, that's what you want, isn't it, from a film? Anyway, I you want so. all those nuances. Well, it's and, complex and contradictory, isn't yeah. it? You're, if, if it had been just like played straight, you'd have been, Goran, hello mate, great, great to see you. No, it doesn't the idea there's rivalry there yeah. and, and politics are being played, even though it's kind yeah. of micro politics. It's yeah, it was really well written. It's really, yeah. really, that, it, was, it was a great script. Mm. Seasoning House was a really good, tight script. It was very good. And we changed very little of it, to be honest. We changed, really? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if anything, I think, I, don't, I think we just, I, you know, between Sean and I, I think we threw a lot of, a, a few F words out, you know, that was, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's, we really didn't change very much at all. Okay. Um, sort of working in, I mean, when, when, when we talk about horror as horror fans, this idea that you're sort of watching violence and horror, it's a vicarious yeah. hobby to have. Now, obviously, playing horror, there's a kind of, there's an, an, another element of that vicariousness. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking, like, I mean, just delivering lines, not necessarily like the, the, the more gross out of scenes, but delivering lines with, like, the kind of normality as if you're saying, hey, it's like a cup of tea. Like, one particular that stuck out for me was, he likes it rough, and he pays extra for it. And, and you say that like you say, yeah, if you just uh, put white sheets on for him, please. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that, see, that's the thing you're always being conscious, like, the dismissiveness of that kind of brutality is what mm. I really think is a strong element in the seasoning house that comes across. Mm. All of it is just so dismissive. It's almost as if, like, all the men are in one world and all these girls are in another. And even though they meet in that very brutal sexual way, mm. there's just, it's like there's a, it's like there's almost like a, a an invisible wall between mm. them all, as if they're not there. They're, they're treated as much like, um, like rubbish. I heard a phrase actually. It was on a newsreel I saw, and it was a young Taliban boy being interviewed. Mm and a Pakistani Taliban boy. Okay. And he was being asked in this, one of these real highbrow documentaries that I love. And this kid was saying, he was asked about his opinion of women and he said, well, they're like plastic bags. And I just sat there and I, my floor, and I thought, my God, that's really what they think. They're just mm. nothing. They blow around in the wind and they're there to be screwed, screwed up and thrown away if necessary. Mm. Or you can put things in them if you want. And that, I took that with me and I thought, it's that kind of dismissiveness of like, they don't mean anything. I don't particularly want to lose any more girls, and that's getting tricky to find the, find the girls all the time. But if this is what happens, it's part of the deal, and fix her up. Let's get her fixed up and whatever, yeah. Okay, well look, one final question for you. Yeah. And this is, this is just a bit, of a, a bit of fun for this one. Okay. Like, talking about the film. Ooh, fun for if, <laughs> if there was any film that could be rebooted in your mind, um, and you got the lead role, and the film gets rebooted, what would, it, what would you relish doing? Well, time? any movie no, you, whatsoever. You can, you can reboot any movie that you love. You get the lead bell role. What would you do? What would you relish doing? Uh, the Magnificent Seven. Really? Yeah. 
And why? why, why I don't know. I just think it's. I just remember it from my. I think every boy yeah. remembers the Magnificent Seven from their childhood. It is such a great western. Right. It was. And I also like the backstory that when it was first done and it was first made, you know, it just it was a total flop in America, really. And it was only when it got built oh, up in right, Europe right, and right. got, you know, and, and then suddenly, you know, and boom, it was out there. I don't think they should, I'm on record, I don't think they should remake <laughs> I don't think they should remake it. But as a boy, yes, yes, yes. you know, you no, just I'm, go... Well, hypothetical, though. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's just so many different genres of movie. That's a Western, you know. You could have also picked horrors or you could have picked a romantic yeah, yeah, comedy yeah, yeah, yeah. or a this or a that or the other. But I just think, I mean, that would just be fun. I nice think that one. would just be fun, you know. Nice one. Well, look, well, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure, Stuart. And, uh, Great to meet you, man. Good luck with this. Yeah, the DVD thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Great, pleasure.